Hey everyone, welcome to Ridge Church Online this week. Glad to have you joining us. If you're new, we're especially glad that you are a part of us today. As we always do, we just want to tell you about one or two things that are happening around this place. And this week it's a little quieter, but I want to let you know that the Lent season is coming up. And as a church, we we always uh, want to celebrate not just the, the weekend of Easter, but the, the time coming up before that. So we're going to give you more information as it comes up here. But we want to invite you to consider taking time, preparing your heart for Easter over the season of Lent. If you want more information, again, keep your eye out on the website and uh, we'll keep you informed. All right, glad to have you with us. Here's our sermon for this week. Uh, well, welcome today. So glad to have you here. Uh, we are in the middle of our series in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he has been walking through this examination of what life is really all about. And he has done it in such an unsentimental way, with, with no dishonesty. It's just been a very clear-eyed examination about what life is really like under the sun. And today in the passage that we're coming to in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he's going to begin to examine the whole area of injustice and corruption and oppression. And this is how he begins. He says this in verse 16, and I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. He says, where there should be righteousness, where there should be justice, instead, I found wickedness. In fact, he, he's going to go on to explain that when he looks at life, when he actually examines it, it's such wickedness. It's like people treat each other like animals. That's what he says in, in verse 18. He says this, I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they're like animals. You know, I watched... Uh, one of those wildlife shows once. It was actually about the, the migration of the wildebeest through Africa. It's amazing. You know, the, the camera follows this massive herd of wildebeest as they travel uh, thousands of miles through Africa. And it was fascinating until they came uh, to this sort of swamp area that these wildebeest had to cross through. And the swamp area was filled with these crocodiles. And literally, as these wildebeest passed through this swampy area, crocodiles would lunge out of the water, grab them by the neck, and drag them underwater. And the camera showed them drowning underwater as a crocodile held them. And then the, the wildebeest that got to the other side, there was a pride of lions waiting there. And, and the camera showed as they, the, as they hunted and, and began to take down these living wildebeest in just this brutal way. And it was just, it was brutal. It was gory. It was, it was heart-wrenching. And the animals that were predators were totally merciless towards their prey. And I, I turned it off. It just wasn't fun to watch. But Solomon says that same kind of thing happens between humans. You know, my son is taking a class uh, genocide studies. They're studying all the, it's amazing how many genocides there's been in the last century. And right now they're studying the Holocaust. And he was telling me that in the Holocaust, the Nazis would come to places like Poland and Czechoslovakia, and they would go into the cities and they would round up all the Jewish people and they would put them in ghettos. In other words, they would build walls around a certain section of the city and force all of the Jewish people to live there. But he explained to me that that wasn't enough for them. It wasn't just enough for them to lock them away in these ghettos. They, they built the ghettos, so it was very difficult to get to, from one end of the ghetto to the other. And then they would take families and disperse them so that families were not together and couldn't get together. And then they would take people and put them in houses with people of different languages and different cultural backgrounds and force them to live together. So there'd be tension. And, and issues and no way to communicate to work through the problems. And they limited the amount of food that came into the ghetto so that people were hungry all the time. And they didn't give power or heat so that literally they would gather outside in large groups to huddle together in the middle of winter because it was warmer to be outside in a large group than to be in their home. And he said that the, the Nazi guards who were patrolling the ghettos were instructed to terrorize the population. So they would go by a lineup of people lined up for, for water or for food, and they would choose eight people randomly out of the, out of the, the lineup, bring them up against the wall, and just put a bullet in the hat back of the first and the second and the third and the fourth person, skip the fifth, kill the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth, and send the fifth back. 
with no reason at all, simply to terrorize them. They were animals. But it's not just the Nazis. I mean, the Rwandan genocide that happened in 1994 happened between the Hutus and, and, and their neighbors, the Tutsis, that they had lived beside, literally neighbor to neighbor for, for decades in that country. But over the course of 100 days, the Hutus r- rose up and, and killed 800,000 of their Tutsi neighbors and friends. In fact, if you read the accounts of that, there were times when the Tutsis fled out into the fields and the Hutu, their very neighbors, would spread out with machetes to search through the field for them to kill them. And they would call their neighbor by name and say, come out so that we can murder you. They're animals. But it isn't just the 1990s. The kind of sex trafficking that goes on today, the kind of child pornography that is produced and consumed is evil. I mean, if you saw the, the movie, The Sound of Freedom, which tells the stories of the efforts to rescue just a few children from the, 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 the thousands, hundreds of thousands that are caught into this kind of, of wickedness, it begins with the scene where this really nice, professional-looking lady invites a father to send his two children to a day program where they can learn some new skills and and she sends the father away says come back at the end of the day and when he comes back the place is empty and she's stolen his children to sell them into sexual slavery for the rest of their life and it's evil it's like animals and it happens all over the world today and there's so much corruption a lady named Dorcas Chan Su, uh, so- Sozun writes about how her family moved to Nairobi, Kenya. And shortly after they moved to that city, a, an apartment building collapsed in the middle of the night, killing 51 people in their sleep. And it turns out that it was built so shoddily and there wasn't even an occupancy permit, but the builders didn't care. And as a result, all of those people were dead. In fact, she she wrote, she said, they did a survey of the other buildings in that city and found 258 other apartment buildings that had the same kind of shoddy construction, mostly in the poor parts of that city. But she said even in her part of the city where they lived, which was a wealthy area, she said they were building another apartment building across the way. And the city would come by and condemn that building and write in bright red letters on the side of the building, this building is condemned. And the next morning, they would come and paint over that bright red sign and continue to build. The same year that that happened in Nairobi, Kenya, in one of the provinces of China, a 7.9 earthquake struck there. And over 7,000 classrooms in schools collapsed, killing over 10,000 students. But the fascinating thing is that the government buildings that were right next to the schools survived perfectly intact. Imagine that. Imagine sending your beautiful seven-year-old son or daughter to school and an earthquake happens and it collapses and kills your precious son or daughter. And the officials that were supposed to make sure that that building was built properly sat safely in their office right next to it and went home having lined their pockets with the bribes that they took from the builders to their family to enjoy their evening. Solomon looked, and he saw the kind of evil and corruption and injustice, and he came to this conclusion. The humans are like animals. And that stuff is rampant. I mean, the the, the Corruption Perceptions Index, which measures corruptions around the world, found that two-thirds of the nations of the world barely scored 50% on their, their, you know, no corruption scale. In fact, two-thirds of the nations have massive corruption in their countries. But it's not just out there. It is injustice here, too. I, I remember the first time that I experienced that kind of infuriating injustice you know uh, my family and I uh, were on a trip to to Greece it would be a family a a plan a trip that we'd planned and dreamed about for for years and we showed up at the airport well before the flight and went to get on the the flight and the the people at the gate said oh I'm sorry uh, you're not on the system your seats have been given to someone else we said oh no no here's the paper we 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 have these seats 
Here's the confirmation number. Here's the payment that we've made. We're on this flight. And they said, no, someone else has your seats. And, and we argued with them for, for four hours until the flight left without us. And then we went home and called up the, the, the company and said, what happened? We're supposed to be in Greece. We have hotels booked and, and people to meet and all sorts of plans. What, what will you do about this? And they said, well, we'll get back to you. I said, well, when? Well, sometime in the middle of next week. The middle of next week? Wait, what, what do you mean? I'm sorry, sir, we can't do anything else today. And they hung up. So that night, we went and bought tickets to fly to Europe the very next day at an incredibly inflated price. And we went off to Europe and that company never, ever, ever called us back. Which meant that when we were in Europe, we had to buy last minute tickets at an inflated price to be able to get home. And when I got home, when I got home, I spent weeks on the phone, writing letters, trying to get a hold of someone, anyone who would help us. And no one did. That airline took our money, canceled our tickets, charged us an outrageous price to fly again, and did nothing about it. <clears throat> and on top of that, we had to borrow money to, to buy those tickets, which means that we pay interest then to, when we were paying off that, that bill. Now listen, I'm not telling you this for sympathy, okay? Uh, in the big picture, what happened to us was nothing. My, my child was not crushed to death in a classroom because of corruption of government officials. My brother was not hunted while he hid in, from his neighbors in a field so that they couldn't hack him to death with their machetes. Our family was never rounded up and put in the ghetto simply because we were uh, of an ethnic or religious persuasion. I mean, the kind of injustice and corruption and oppression that is experienced around the world is nothing, uh, uh, that we experience rather, the kind of injustice that we experience is nothing compared to what hundreds of millions of people around the world experience. We're just fine. But what I found so jarring, so infuriating for me as someone who lives in this kind of a country is that there was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't get a hold of a human being face to face, just over a phone. There's some place out there and they could do nothing. And I couldn't get a hold of the, the director or the vice president who made such a policy to say, how could you? He and his wife are probably going to the opera in their fancy car and couldn't care less. I put a complaint in with the government on their webpage. We looked, there's 85,000 other complaints. So I'm waiting for someone to get back to me. It's not going to happen, right? And, and I thought, you know what? It's, it's a significant amount of money. I could take them to court. But if I told you the name of the airline, it's a major airline. I mean, they would bury me in court. They, they would cost me so much in expenses and take so much of my time with their fancy lawyers. There's no way that I'll ever get justice on that thing. See, this is the thing about injustice. There is no recourse. Solomon puts it so starkly. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. But here's his point. This is a human experience. We all have our stories of injustice. I mean, I know people who got totally shafted in a divorce settlement because the judge literally couldn't be bothered to look at all the documents they gave presenting their situation and made a ruling against them that affected them for decades. I know of small businessmen who did a large job, over $100,000 worth of work for some other guys, did it very well. And when it was done, those men came to him and looked him in the eye and said, we are not going to pay you. And they didn't. And the company that he had spent so much time and energy building and pouring his heart into, it ended up going bankrupt. I know people, and myself included, who have been caught by scams. Scams are so sophisticated these days and the money is simply gone. And there's no way to ever find those people and bring them to justice. By the way, talking about scams, you know they're so sophisticated these days. And one of the ways that, that some scammers work is through what's called affinity fraud. They'll, they'll actually target a church like ours 
because it's filled with people who love and trust one another. And they'll find somebody and, and, and offer them a great investment deal and pay them great returns on their investment with the intention that that person will then go and, and share with a bunch of other people in the church so they get involved in that same investment. And when it turns out to be a scam, when it all collapses, then not only does that person steal all of their money, but it destroys all kinds of friendships between people who walk together for years and, and it can destroy a church. Let's be careful. Let, let's, let's just watch out for one another so gently, not messing in each other's worlds, but let's just watch out gently that that kind of thing doesn't happen among us. Here's the point that, that Solomon is making. Injustice is part of the human experience. I bet you have your own story. And if you haven't experienced injustice yet, you will. It happens to all of us at some point and sometimes at a number of points in our lives because people treat other people like animals. So that's what Solomon goes on to, to say about that. He says this in verse 19. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. Solomon says, when you see the corruption and the oppression and the injustice that happens in this world, you realize that humans are not different than animals. I mean, what difference is the lion eats the wildebeest or a human kills another human? The animals die, we die. The animals end up as dust, we end up as dust. If there is no God, then wherever the animal of the spirit goes, that's where the, animal, the spirit of the, the human goes, which is nowhere, down to the ground. So who cares? It's all meaningless. It's all vapor. It's all smoke. But it's not vapor and it's not smoke if there is a good God who created us not to be the same as the animals, but rather who made us in his own image and who gave us therefore inherent dignity and who put eternity in our hearts. If that's the case, then the kind of injustice and corruption and oppression that happens in the world is heartbreaking. And that's what, that's what Solomon writes next in chapter 4, verse 1. He said, again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they have no comforter. It's got to be one of the saddest verses in the Bible. The injustice in this world is so heartbreaking, so infuriating, so wicked, so wrong. I mean, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. In fact, it leads Solomon to this conclusion. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. When Solomon looks at the kind of evil and injustice that is done, he says, you know what? It's better if you were never born. Apart from God, injustice leads to hopelessness. It'd be better if you had just never been born. But only if there's no God. Only if this life is all that there is. Only if your underlying philosophy is that this world is premised on the idea of the survival of the fittest. I mean, if you hold to an evolutionary worldview, then this is the way that the world should be, right? The strong should survive to propagate the species. And the weak should get weighted out. I mean, they're there only to help the strong get stronger so that they can propagate the species. Isn't that how evolution is supposed to work? I mean, according to the evolution, there's no difference between humans and animals. We're all the same. I mean, look around. 
The corrupt and the powerful die peacefully in their sleep, in their old age, fat and surrounded by opulence. And the poor die young in squalor and pain and poverty and utterly without hope. That's the way of evolution. But Solomon isn't an evolutionist. He believes in a good God who is sovereign over all. So if there is a good God, and if he is sovereign over all, then this, this raises this question. Well, then where is God in the midst of all of the injustice and the oppression and the corruption that happens in the world? Now, if you go back to the first part of this passage that we've been looking at in verse 17, Solomon says, I'll tell you where he is. Here's what he said. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. Solomon said, God isn't blind. He isn't absent or apathetic. He's not impotent. He sees what's going on and he's incensed and he's angry and he hates it. And Solomon said, there is a time coming. But as he just pointed out earlier in this chapter, there's a time that God ordains But there is a time, he says, when when God will come and he will judge the righteous and the wicked. And on that day, God will pour out his wrath on the wickedness of those who have acted like animals towards others. Now, the idea that God is a God of judgment, I mean, that, that God is a God of wrath, that's not an idea that's very popular in our world these days. God is just supposed to be all love. He's just supposed to woo us and, and, and continually forgive us and just pour out his grace on us. And, and, and he's just supposed to be gentle and, and kind to everyone, everywhere, all the time. But those who, who want that kind of a God have never experienced real injustice. Listen to what the Croatian theologian Miroslav Wolf writes. He says, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to that carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandfatherly fashion? by refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against the God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. We get that, don't we? I mean, when someone that you love is mistreated, when your kid is bullied at school, when your parents are taken advantage of, when your friend is attacked, you get angry, don't you? You want to do something about it. Why? Because you love them. When you hear the stories that I've told already, I mean, that makes you mad, right? Why? Because you care about people. Because you know that they're not animals. They've been created in the image of God. The anger and the wrath that you feel, the desire for judgment doesn't mean that you are unloving. No, no. It's the opposite. It means that you do love. The idea of a God who never gets angry, a God who's just loving, who's just all the time, you know, just mousy and and kind to everyone and who ignores the cry of the weak and the downtrodden through all of eternity. That kind of a God is repulsive. I mean, that kind of a God is not a good God. That kind of a God is not worthy of worship. What makes God good is that he does not leave the wicked go unpunished. He brings justice. 
He pours wrath out on the wicked in his time, not ours, and because of his great love for us. You see, according to Solomon, according to the, to, to the Bible, God's wrath is not the problem, it's the solution. In fact, you shouldn't find the idea of God's wrath offensive. Rather, you should find the idea of God's wrath to be deeply hopeful, incredibly encouraging. If the corrupt and powerful die peacefully in their sleep, fat and surrounded by opulence, and the poor die young in squalor and pain and poverty, then God will make it right. In the end, both will get what they actually deserve, the wicked punishment and the righteous rewards. See, here's what Solomon is saying about the judgment of God. The judgment of God brings justice and gives hope. So, does that mean that we as Christians should do nothing about the injustice and the corruption and the oppression in this world? Of course not. Of course not. God calls us, especially us, who've experienced the grace of Jesus in our life to care for the poor and the widow and the orphan and the refugee and the immigrant and the weak and the vulnerable. He calls us to stand up for injustice and to seek righteousness. Micah 6.8 famously says this. He's shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You know, we as followers of Jesus are called to actively participate in, in pursuing justice around the world. Of course, we should pray for it, but, but, but more than that, we should act. One of the ways that we do that as a church is to support ministries like Casa Ogar, uh, a orphanage in Honduras, and Impact Ministries, a ministry in central Guatemala, uh, which provides education and health care and, and, uh, and vocational training to all kinds of uh, uh, young people in that part of the world. And it's something that you participate through. You're giving to the ministry of our church. In fact, uh, coming up this year, uh, there will be uh, one and maybe two opportunities for you to go down to one of those places and actually serve there in person and to help with the ministry that's happening there. Of course, not everyone can go or feels called to go. Not everyone can just drop their job and move uh, to some other part of the world and work against injustice. But if we are walking in step with the heartbeat of God, then it's vital that somewhere, some way, we are participating, that you are participating in the fight against injustice around the world. Which means that as a follower of Jesus in North America, in Canada, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, that at very minimum, you should be giving at least some of your money to fight against poverty and injustice and corruption around the world. And you could do, I mean, you can give here, but there are all sorts of other great organizations. There's Compassion International, there's International Justice Mission, there's other organizations but if you're not going, which is understandable, not everyone can go, but you're also not giving any of your money at all or just a, just a pittance towards something like that, which causes you to stop for a moment and examine your heart. Ask yourself, do I really love people? Do, do I really care about this stuff? To stop and say, God, what, where are you calling me to be more involved in this? Because God hates that kind of evil, especially against those who are most, most vulnerable. And the Bible makes it utterly clear that those who know and follow God are meant to be actively engaged in doing something about the injustice in this world. That said, no matter how much we do, no matter how much we give and how much, uh, and how much we go, there will be times that the powerful and the rich and the, and the corrupt and those who oppress will die peacefully in their sleep thinking that they got away with it. But they won't. In the end, God will judge them. In the end, his justice will prevail. But, but the question is, but what do we do in the meantime? I mean, when we have done what we can to help others, when we've come to realize that there is there will be some things in our life where for, 
where we will never get justice, then how should we live? Well, Solomon's going to give us the answer. And at first, it seems kind of odd. It comes right after he explains how people treat other people like animals. And, and just before he, he says that the, you know, the, 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 the oppressed have this sense of hopelessness. Here's what he says in verse 22. He says this. So I saw that there's nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that's their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? And what's Solomon saying here? I mean, there's oppression and injustice and wickedness and and you should just go back to work? Is that, is that what he's saying? And actually, that's exactly what he's saying. After you've done whatever you can about the injustice in your life, after you've actively done what you can to help fight against the injustice in the lives of others, you should go back to work. You should go back to whatever it is that God has given you to do. Because you see, if God is sovereign, and if he is just, and if you have done all that you reasonably can, then in the end, you should relax. You should trust God. You should go back to enjoying the life that God has given you because God will do what you are not able to do. He will ensure that justice is done which means that you can even forgive those who did injustice against you because you don't have to worry. Justice will be done. Here's what Psalm is saying. Trust God for the justice that you can't make happen. You know, so often when injustice happens in our lives, it burns us up, doesn't it? I mean, who sometimes for years, I mean, we're, we're fueled by, by our revenge fantasies that, that slowly morph into bitterness. And the injustice of it all becomes like this acid in our veins that slowly burns us up from the inside out. And we begin to blame that injustice, that mistreatment for all kinds of things in our life. The, the lack of success that we're having, the, the fact that we're not happy like we want to be, the, the fact that we're not in the place in life that we think that we ought to be. And it burns us up. And the injustice continues to take advantage of us. But Solomon says, you don't have to be that way. If you know God, if you trust his justice, go back to work. Go back to what it is that God has put before you to do. Go back to what you love doing and do it. And leave all the rest to God. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Heavenly Father, it's such a, such a fascinating way to think about the injustice and the oppression and the corruption in this world God that we should do what we can but when we can't do anymore we turn it over to you and trust that you because you love us so deeply will see that justice is done in our lives and in the lives of so many others in your time and in your way God thank you for your justice thank you for your wrath thank you for your judgment that goes against those who would treat others like animals God, you're a good God. You're worthy of all of our praise. You're worthy of our worship, God, because of who you are. So we can be at peace in our world. We can go back to what you called us to do. God, may those things not burn us up, but may we leave them with you and allow you to do what only you can do, knowing that you will do what is right. Thank you, God. We trust you. We rest in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming and joining us today. Let me send you out with these words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. 
Well, hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridge Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that it was just a great opportunity for you to connect and learn more about following God and knowing Jesus. And we just want to invite you to continue to engage with us here. But we also believe that one of the best ways to follow Jesus is in the context of community. And so let me just take a quick moment and tell you what Ridge Church is all about. We're really about three things. The first thing is about Jesus. Above all, uh, Jesus is the reason for, that we exist. Our goal, our desire is that you would know Jesus and be known by Jesus and that he would change and transform your life. The second, we believe that community is really important. You know, in a world with so many digital connections and so few genuine connections, we believe that one of the best ways to live life, one of the most healthy ways, and certainly one of the, the, the ways to follow Jesus best is in the context of community. And so regardless of what stage you're, of life you're in or uh, where you're at in your spiritual journey, we want to invite you to come and to join us and to walk with a few others, to be known by them and to know them as we follow Jesus together. And then thirdly, we're about city. And by that, we mean that we want to be a place and a people who love our city, who love our neighbors and serve them and care for them and just walk alongside of them so that our city flourishes. And we want to be known by our city as a group of people, as a church that offers hope and life and care and love to anyone who's looking for that kind of thing. So that's really what we're all about. Jesus, community, and city. And we'd love to have you join us. If you want to know more, just fire off an email to hello at ridgechurch.ca and someone will get back to you. Or better yet, just come by for a service, 10.30 Sunday mornings. Look forward to seeing you soon.